Welcome to Season 3, Episode 25 of the Draft Rugby Podcast, where we discuss Fantasy Super Rugby, the game they play online in heaven. Check out the platform at draftrugby.com and you'll find us on the socials at Draft Rugby. I'm joined once again by the lads on Zoom. Some are struggling more with the Zoom virtual backgrounds than others, um, as you might note, if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you you haven't... You can distinctly tell which part of it is stuffing up for Harry. It's around the eyebrow area, which he has no eyebrow, so I can't recognise that he's a person. It's true. We've figured out that Harry actually can defeat any facial recognition software. Oh, sorry, no. Facial recognition software just doesn't work for Harry, full stop. Um, You do need eyebrows for that to operate. So, um, yes. But anyway, no, joining me, the lads, um, Harry and Nelson. Now, look, it was a very big weekend for these two brothers. They faced up in their fantasy matchup this weekend. They pulled out all manner of trades to get as close to, fi- to starting a, a fielding 15 as possible. Mm-hmm. And uh, I will ask the victor to come forward and tell our listeners how it all went down. Look, uh, Harry had every chance here. I only meant to have two guys on the buy. So Tutu didn't get named. K- uh, Clark didn't get named. Everything came out for, for pointing towards Harry with the win and he's just not good enough. That's that's just the way it is. He's just not good enough. Yeah, now, listeners, like, if you are if you do need to sit down and take a moment because you're just the shock that it was Nelson that spoke up, look, I, I can understand. Um, and that was, you know, as all things considered, that was a very humble response from um, Nelson Dale. But um, Harry, mate, what, do you, uh, what, what excuses have you got for us? What's in the bag? And... And also, I guess, I'm sure you're going to bring up um, how the record uh, against uh, Nelson has, um, tra- has transpired over the last few years. One in a row, mate. Congratulations, One in a row. Uh, congratulations to Nelson. His winning record against me now is not unlike the Aussies against any New Zealand side. So congratulations, <laughs> Nelson. Uh, on top of the world this week. Enjoy it. I think you're still below me on the table. So not all is lost at the world right now. Um, yeah, you, also, you, guys, we all you, know that history is written by the winner. So it's good that Nelson told you about all the players that didn't play. Let's say no more. You know, if any, if let's let's leave it as my team must have been at full strength. Nothing's gone wrong. But uh, yeah, to lose yeah. Nelson clearly it was a bit of a train wreck week. But a no, nine, no. nineteen point loss. Take a couple of bonus points out of it. It's not the end of the world. No, you're a loser, mate. It is true, Harry. Look, I was going to just. Um, start off the pod by completely ignoring Nelson and asking you if you were all right. Like if you were, if, you, if you've been ill, if something happened, um, but uh, look, no, we have to give credit where it's due. We do very much enjoy shitting on Nelson week in, week out. It is, I say every week, it's about 50% of the reason I turn up for this pod, but um, <laughs> no, look, the man has, he's got one over you and um, in a, in a super rugby 2022.0 where you only get to play each manager once mm. he's, he's going to hold the uh, the bragging rights until next well, year. The, the really tough That's thing is Nelson doesn't play finals so I'm not going to get another chance. That's <laughs> <laughs> he had that one loaded in the chamber ready to fire. <laughs> 100% success rate against Harry mm. in uh, I guess my Super Rugby 2.0 how good. And look, I, I could very easily sneak under the radar here because the two brothers will just go at each other forever. But I did also come away with a loss this week. So um, bringing myself hurtling back down from the top of the table. Um, so I don't know where I've landed yet, but we'll uh, find yeah, you're out. Still what's... First. You're still first. There's three of us on 10 points. Right. Four and against has got you on top at the moment. How yeah, good. There's, there's, that's it. There's, it's a very tight five. And then uh, there's three guys that are a long way down. But, Craigs, it, it, you were a deserved loser this week as well, if we point out the points that you actually got. You were, you were quite clearly a loser. Thank you, yes. No, I was actually going for the most yellow cards this week. You know, I, I thought I'd try a new <laughs> tact, um, but it didn't uh, pen off me. So, yeah. Alas, anyway, let's, um, let's move on. And uh, on our menu for tonight, uh, for Entree, <clears throat> we'll be reviewing Draft Rugby Round 3. For main course, previewing round four. And for dessert, we're going to look at, I've now forgotten, again, very professional, but we're going to look at, Nelson, what are we looking at? We're looking at the top average performers to date in this season. That's it. And if you think that it's only been three rounds, how can you look at averages? Just keep in mind, there's only seven rounds of the comp. Um, So averages, we'll see how, exactly. We'll see who's who's holding the top spots down. Um, and some of them are interesting, you know, some of them are not who you would have thought. So, 
Anyway, we'll get to that. All right, so for Entree, uh, the buy this week, we had the Rebels and the Crusaders. Um, and uh, in the first first match on Friday night, we had the Reds and the Force. And <clears throat> what a ripper. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump into this one. Um, in terms of new injuries, we had Jack Stracker, who... who? Yeah, yeah, who he got a concussion and Ian Pryor, he hurt his shoulder quite early and was replaced. The Reds got away with this one, 31-24. It was a really good game to watch. Um, I, I talked to a lot of Kiwis as well that thought this was a pretty brilliant game. The Western Force, they just, they started really fast again like they did in, in round one. They scored two tries early with some enterprising play. The scrum was really solid yet again. It, it was just something that uh, I think they need to utilise more. Their line-outs was terrible yet again. So uh, for them, don't kick the ball out. If you get a penalty, take a, a tap or a scrum. That's as simple as it is for them. And there was we'll a lot of Queenslanders in the force who have really stepped up in this game. They really won. They were playing yeah. in front of friends and family and they really had some blinders there. Yeah, even in, including people like Andrew Reddy, off the bench, they they had a, a quite a few Kiwis, uh, Queenslanders there, including uh, uh, Ralston, uh, the winger, and um, Wagner, the prop, both had huge games. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Look, J- John Lance, I thought was the the better performing of the two fly halves. Uh, he played really flat to the line. He had a lot of runners outside and willing to hit hit at pace as well and look for those gaps. It didn't work for him always, but it, and I think he did sort of have a an intercept or, or two against him, but none as telling as uh, the on the flip side when James O'Connor tried to flood in the, the attacking line and uh, Ralston, uh, Byron Ralston, got an intercept almost on his own line, ran 90 metres, and boy, oh boy, is he quick. He just charged in a long way ahead of anyone and Dow Goon, who had no chance of catching him. Um, and he scored a try through there. But I think it was a pretty brilliant game by John Lance, and I thought he was the better of the two. His issue, the thing that let him down, he, he only got two of his four kicks. One was charged down, which is now the, the second time we've seen that happen to someone in two weeks of rugby in four games, or eight, eight games, sorry. It's the second charge down. If you <laughs> are picking the ball from directly in front, just move it back I five know. meters. Who's it's kicking for ten meters? Drop kick it. Like it is the easiest kick. If you're going to get charged down, that is pathetic. And uh, he also missed a relatively easy kick, which that was the, the four points that they were down um, towards the back end of the game. James O'Connor then capitalized and did a drop goal to put him seven at the Reds seven points ahead. But far out. I mean, that, that, those kicks proved telling. Um, the Reds scored three tries in seven minutes. They uh, lifted the intensity to, to go up 21-14. Uh, and just before halftime, that's when Ralston snatched that try and that first missed kick by Lance happened. So the, the Reds went in 21-19 at halftime. Pace Army, he got uh, his weekly yellow card in uh, Super Rugby. That's his second in two weeks uh, for a dangerous tackle. This time, he didn't almost kill someone. It's, it's um, him and Tupo. They've got to take turns, you know? Yeah. There's a roster. There's no taking turns for Pace Army. He will always stick his hands up for a yellow card. Um, but it was a fantastic game to watch. Um, it, I think there was a lot of talk about Jock with his kick towards the back end. I thought it was a smart choice with the extra time. But in terms of match stats, the Reds had 55% of possession, 61 territory. They had less metres, 405 to 560 but they had double the tackle busts, 34 to 17. They had 89% of their tackles compared to the force, 82%, which I do think is, is quite an improvement for them. It was four tries apiece. The conversions were what separated them, four, four from four for Jock and two from four for Lance. The line outs for the Reds was 90%, nine from 10. It was only 71%, 10 from 14 for the force. Both teams won 100% of their scrums. Nine penalties against the Reds plus their yellow card and five for the Force. Byron Ralston, the Queensland youngster, playing for the Force from Brothers Club. He got 72 points as the fantasy man of the match. He had two tries, making it three from two matches in Super Rugby. Seven runs for 141 metres. That is 20 metres a run. Granted, 90 of those were off one run. Uh, three tackle busts, two line breaks, and one offload. Tate McDermott got 65. 
uh, Chris Failway, so TR61, Brendan Pangamo, so 59, Liam Wright, 58, Filippo Dalgunu, 56, Lucan Salakaya Lotto, 52. And for the force, my boy Henry Stowers stood up. I think he made 23 tackles. He had 51 points. He's a beast. He is. Very good. All right. Well, um, no, that was it. Was a fantastic game, and yeah, if you if you haven't done so, I'm sure the highlights or the KM mini would be really good. But otherwise, just watch the first half. The first 20 minutes, unreal, really. John, John O'Lance, some of that fly half play, putting the balls out in front, that was fantastic. He was, he was brilliant. Man. He was really good. What a difference a week makes. I can't believe we didn't start this entree with that. Two phenomenal Aussie games. Two phenomenal Kiwi games. Last week we were sitting here. Disappointed there was three <laughs> rubbish games. It was awesome all round. And Kiwi fans, Aussie fans, South African fans, everyone around the world, it was champagne rugby all round. I, I love my rugby and I love my Kiwis. But if that is the standard of Aussie super rugby playing each other, I will happily watch that every week. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. I want to watch Kiwis and I will watch Kiwis wherever they're playing. But I will accept that because that was brilliant. Look, they're slowly winning me around. I might not pick my fantasy team exclusively from New Zealand in the future. Um, but, uh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of points on offer just there as you r- rattled off that list of the Reds, wasn't there? Oh, yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, so this next match we, was a, a real close one. Uh, on Saturday, first game, we had the Hurricanes and the Blues. Harry, do you want to uh, take us through this one? Yep. Yeah, so 29 to 27, the Hurricanes got mm. over the Blues. In a little bit of a thriller, um, I think the, the Hurricanes were definitely the better side here, though, having said that. Uh, returning in this one, you had Dane Coles coming back from his calf injury. There was a bit of a concern that might be quite serious, but straight back in and looked back to his best. I remember he scored that very, very good line, uh, maybe one pass out from the ruck and still had his little turn of pace that uh, an old front rower has. <laughs> Reed Princep as well, back from his hamstring injury, scored one as well. So obviously that was the key. But uh, that one off the back of a rolling mall stole it from, uh, I think, Dane Coles himself, wasn't it? Mm. And uh, yeah, yeah. Fraser Armstrong as <clears throat> well came back from his minor knee injury. I think he was expected to start behind Ben May, who himself was pulled before the game started. I'm not sure. I don't know if you guys have heard anything about why he was pulled, Ben May, but... I thought he was excellent last week and Fraser Armstrong, excellent this week. Look, if I was a girl and he was a a good rugby player like that, I'd probably pull him too. And you have, and you have, so. Right, good. And Terra Black as well, uh, he he went down for a a pretty heavy knock. The match doctor, not the team doctor, pulled him off for a HIA, which apparently he passed. Um, But then with about 30 minutes to go, they decided just to leave Bodie Barrett at 10 to give him a bit of a run out there. It's obviously pretty disruptive if you're having good. to shift your whole back line around and then put them back out. So it was good to see them give him an actual opportunity from that position as well. Was that not yeah. a different incident to where uh, Lao Marpe sent him into <laughs> flying into another universe or was, it, was that the incident? No, I think that was a different one, yeah. Okay, right. That was, uh, that was within a minute, so slightly different. If you watch the highlights from this game, you might. Uh, we often refer to the Reds as the Queensland Karevis. Uh, it kind of feels like the Wellington Lamapes at the moment. Um, Absolutely, like the... they should have put player count. No. Anyway, yeah. let's oh, think. Think. so Lamapes first of all standing up Bowden Barrett was just outrageous. Showed him the inside, then burnt him on the outside for pace, which we didn't think was possible. See no. the background there for a, a bit of a replay, and then about five minutes later, he barged right over the top of him down the same left hand touch line. Bowden Barrett tried to step across and like carry him back over him. And mm. Lamarpe just busted straight through him. There was a photo going mm. on Twitter of looking from behind Lamarpe at Bowden Barrett's face. And he's just like shocked that he doesn't want to make his hit. And they've just zoomed in on him from like five meters out from the contact. And Bowden looks terrified. The, the nightmare memes have already begun. They're fantastic. <laughs> it does it look like Lamarpe was putting himself out there to match himself up against Bodie. So... He's going to be having nightmares. Um, Hurricanes, they dominated possession and territory in this one. They controlled most of the game really, really well. I think they had 65% possession, 69% uh, territory. Then the Blues, they just they just looked tired. They didn't look like, them, like themselves at all. Uh, we heard at halftime, Helen Gahu, the assistant coach, say that they needed to pick up their intensity. And Tana Rumanga late in the game as well said the exact same thing. <clears throat> So, I mean, both both coaches were singing the same message and that was that they weren't actually 
on the ball and they weren't up to it for themselves. And I think the uh, post-game interviews were saying the same thing. Where they were good, the Blues, was from their rolling mall. They scored three tries, either directly or indirectly from that. So that's turning into a real weapon for them. On the flip side, you had Peter among a Jensen, who we were questioning, getting the run over Vince Asso. He was great. I thought his best game I've seen him play. Jordy Barrett and Karifi were excellent as well for the Hurricanes. Obviously, we've already mentioned Lamefe, who was far and away the man of the match. Um, Round around. You know, on the flip side, after bagging Bodie, that try that he scored in the first half when he was at first receiver, just putting the afterburners on and blasting through the line when it looked like there was nothing on. I mean, I think that shows that three years at first receiver, and it was disappointing that he didn't get to throw the ball around a little bit more um, in the 30 minutes that he was playing at fly half. On this one, run meters 571 to 202. So the <laughs> Hurricanes just with all the play, 31 tackle buster, 13. I'm pretty 30, sure, pretty sure all 44 of those were Lau Mafe. <laughs> and uh, line breaks 14 to two as well. So very one-sided. I thought the, the Hurricane scrum was worth a mention. Didn't turn over any ball, but had the blues on ice skates all night. And then, uh, obviously, the fantasy man of the match was La Mafe with 72 points, a try, 16 runs for 160 metres, magic 10 a metre, 10 metres a run, five tackle busts, four line breaks and a couple of turnovers. You then had Artie Sevilla on 57, Coles and TJ on 47, Kirk Eklund with his first start, 46 point, and Bodie Barrett, 45 points as well. Good game of footy. Very good. Yeah, no, absolutely. <clears throat> Down to the wire. Um, Fantastic. Another close game. Uh, the rest of the games are all very close. But um, the fo- directly following this was the Tars and the Brumbies out at ANZ Stadium in Sydney. It's uh, kind of good having all of the rugby in Australia in Sydney. But at the same time, we, I, we, I think all of us have been unable to get out to the game. So uh, yeah. it's That's been a little annoying. But um, I mean, and, and who wants to go out to ANZ Stadium anyway? Let's be honest. Um, yeah, keep them all up in Brookvale next to me. That, that worked well. Um, so, uh, in this one, we had uh, returning Tom Banks uh, from a foot injury and Tom Robertson for the Tars um, from a back injury, um, the Wallabies prop, uh, and he went straight into starting and played the whole game. Mm. Um, and the reason he played the whole game was because Angus Bell, uh, the Angus Bell that we all love, uh, he was pulled pre-game uh, with a back niggle. So, Tom Robertson, it was like, welcome back, and mate, we need you to play the 80. So was, um, and I think he did pretty well. Uh, also injured, Noel Alessio, a hamstring. It looked, um, well, he looked pretty torn up about it. I mean, obviously you can limp off or walk off, but um, what, what did you guys think of the severity of that? Um, they're saying they're going for scans to see how severe it was, but it was down the bottom kind of quarter of his hamstring, which is probably the least severe in hammy injuries. The higher up the thigh from kind of middle upwards becomes more and more severe. So, I mean, it could still be four to six weeks, which will cook him for, for the competition because it's so short. But in the big scheme of things, it's not a terrible hamstring injury. Fair enough. All right. And the other injury worth noting was James Slipper with a concussion during this one. And uh, oh, it's very difficult for the Brumbies just to bring on the other Wallabies starting loose end prop, Scott Seo. So it's tough yeah, gig for them. They weren't very good. So uh, the Waratahs prop. This scrum was that, terrible. That's fair. Um, yeah, I think, um, look... The, in this game, the Waratahs started off to an absolute flyer. They put some points on the board. And it just, uh, it was kind of like, spoiler alert here for the Chiefs in the next game. But yeah, it was just like the, the Tars playing some of the best footy you know they're capable of and just blowing the, the Brumbies off the park. Um, Brumbies just kind of looked around, didn't know what to do with themselves. But um, the one quality that the Brumbies do have, which is very Crusader-like, is that they manage to just stay composed and stay in games. And so... You know, despite the Tars starting off with a few tries, the Brumbies were backing it by half time. I think it was twenty around twenty to seventeen for half time. I might have got that wrong, but um, uh, they were unlucky, you know, not to go into the break ahead. I think um, there's was kind of a massive momentum switch. Um, but yeah, the uh, in the second half, Harrison just needed to kick his penalty to go nine up, uh, and they probably would have done enough. But um, I think Harrison's not. letting you down. Indeed, indeed. I um, actually can't remember. I'm trying to remember what more things that happened in this game. But um, look, the other positives... The, the Tars looked really good for a period, maybe from 50 to 70. And they looked like they were controlling, but they just weren't putting points on the board. They were, 
then then it kind of went this weird back and forth where both teams are having a real crack trying to score points and every time they got into a good position they would turn the ball over or they would give a penalty away so really enterprising good play with good aggressive defense as well but it was just that that final execution from both teams where I don't think they had quite the, the same kind of composure under pressure when things were starting to go their way that some of the Kiwi sides did. One thing that wasn't written down here is how good was it to watch when the, the Tars had a penalty advantage, um, Will Harrison decided to tap the ball and crossfield oh. kick to James Ram, who ended up scoring. That was just awesome to see the confidence of those two blokes to call that and pull it off. Mm. Yeah, you you love to see those type of quick tap moves. I mean, Tate McDermott did a quick tap scrum half try in uh, round one. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. That's yeah, common, that's... mate. This this is special. This was yeah. so different. Long cross field kick. Hey, um, yeah. on this one, I was I wrote a bit of blurb about, um whinging about Angus Gardner. Mm. I could say for context, he did uh, give a pretty dodgy yellow card to Andy Muirhead in the first half uh, for some uh, to level it up a little bit, but. Pretty much every close call in the last 10 minutes went against the Brumbies. Sorry, mm. went against the Waratahs, which is kind of what piggybacked the Brumbies down before their try as well. And then mm. in the last play, second last ruck, Cooper was all over the ball. The way it had been repped all night, it had to be a penalty, and they just didn't give it. And they're so quick to ping anyone when the hands are on the ball. It was really, really disappointing. And that was the game. That was the last chance that they had to actually attack the ball. So Cooper was... Filthy. Every Waratahs supporter was filthy as well. I agree. And look, we all, with our uh, Waratahs coloured glasses on, were definitely filthy. But at the end of the day, um, I mean, a halfback bloody Isaac Fine scored a try through two back rowers, Lockie Swinton and Will Harris. Now, it was obviously definitely Lockie Swinton's fault, but how do they not tackle a halfback, mate? There was no, it's not like there was a huge gap. Oh, there was, there was we, no we... excuse for missing <clears throat> There's there's no excuse, but it was a very weird, weird thing to happen. They they also had Tom Robertson coming up from the inside, run directly into the ref, which meant then the def- the structure of where they were all standing was destroyed as well. They didn't have the inside runner coming up. And... The team. Mm. What was that? So the back rowers are clearly the bludgers of the team. <laughs> now, look, uh, getting into some of the stats... Um, well, actually, the last comment of the game was how good did um, Tommy Horden look? The uh, Tars. Um, uh, Horden was start really really starting well. now. Yeah, he was fantastic. So yeah. um, that one Nelson in the game, mind you, picking up Horton. I picked up Equin. He picked up Horton. That was the game. Horton was clearly better. Crack your Aussies, mate. Very good. All right. So anyway, getting into the stats. Um, oh, what's this rugby ecology stat we've got here? Three... So yeah, this, this was something that was awesome to see. Rugby ecology on Twitter at rugby ecology. This guy's doing live stats for the game and, and very insightful stats. One that I got out of this game was that it, for a three pass sequence. So you have to at least play three three passes. The Tars did it sixteen times in the opposition's 50 metres, where the Brumbies did it only once in the Tars' 50 metres. So the Tars were throwing the ball around and actually chancing their arm in the attacking zone where the Brumbies shut up shop and try to play in tight. Very good. All right, well, look, I would love to quickly quickly gloss over these stats, but um, some of them are really good. So uh, possession and territory, Brums had 58% of both uh, metres, 300 Tars, 450 to the Brumps. Had quite a lot more. The Brumps had 27 tackle busts to 15. Um, turnovers won, as Harry mentioned about. The Tars only with two and the Brumbies with seven. So, <clears throat> weren't lucky to get a few of those at the end. Um, and then the, the big the big surprise was the set-piece dominance by the Tars. 100% of their scrums, they won. The Brumbies, 67%. Lineouts, Tars, 90% to the Brumbies, 64%. Who saw that coming? Um, That's eight in a lineout in the last twenty. They could not win a lineout. That is eight lost lineouts. That is absurd. Yeah, no, it's huge. Um, and then for fantasy man of the match, we had Tommy Horton, um, who bagged himself a try um, and just had a generally good game. He scored sixty six points. Um, and for the Brumbies, the only one really worth mentioning was Robbie Valentini, forty five points, starting to find a bit of form again. So. Um, both mine. That's it. How good? For the record, so, Selling Horton Short also had three turnovers, seven carries, 15 tackles, a couple of tackle busts, and a line break as well. 
were those important? I mean, that's it. No, okay. He, no, he, look, he was, he was fantastic. We can't talk, talk him up enough. So very yeah. good. All right. And on to the last fixture of round three, we had the Chiefs and the Highlanders. And if it was a competition for closest games, this one won. Um, but uh, this, yeah. This, this game was an absolute thriller. It actually wasn't as close score-wise as the last game, Craigs. I'll point that out. But they... Uh, oh, they I just meant, went down to the wire, mate. It was. It was very much in the wire. The Chiefs uh, lost this one 31-33. I'll go into detail in a second. But uh, Joshua Arnie returned from his groin injury coming on at second half to, to the fly half role. Anton Leonard brown returned from his concussion and he was back and firing. Uh, Mitch Karpik returned from a concussion. New injuries. Aiden Ross injured himself in the second minute or so. Leg or Achilles. I, I haven't been able to find any updates since. Have you, Harry? I think it was an ankle. Just remembering the commentary, I think it was an, I, I, just an I ankle. I had a look uh, today. They said ankle or Achilles, but they, uh, they hadn't said anything when I looked just before the podcast. Harry, hold that trophy tight because you're not going to have it again at the end of this year. Um, Chiefs came out firing in this one. Brilliant start. Back to their signature super fast-paced fast, super fast paced footy. Um, just runners in motion all the way around the paddock. And, and I mean, boy, oh, boy, do they have a, a, a scary back line throwing Alamalo back into the starting side as well. well it was they're, just- they're absolutely brilliant. It was just options, mate. Like, how many runners they had? I mean, even Boshir was, uh, he hit this fantastic line, oh, mate. split the team in the middle of the field and, and ran in 25 metres untouched for the try. Like, they just had so many options and runners hitting these awesome lines. Boshir was the, the best average in the game at the moment on fantasy as well. Boshir was an absolute standout in this one. He also closed that game out and almost won it for the Chiefs, stealing ball after ball in that last five to ten minutes. I think he had two or three in the last ten minutes, penalties or turnovers. Just the Chiefs didn't want to round it out for him. Uh, they, they were up to a 24 to nil lead uh, after about the same amount of minutes. Rob Thompson got yellow carded to make matters worse. Nankavel for his first start of Super Rugby out there. He combined very well with Anton Leonard Brown, giving Anton Leonard Brown that platform. He didn't do too much himself to, to break through that defensive line, but Anton Leonard Brown was back in form. The Highlanders had some good phase play, uh, but the Chiefs defense was, was very tough and very solid early on in this one. Yeah, no, the Highlanders had some like some of their best best attack, but the Chiefs were just up to the task. They just couldn't break it. Even Shannon Frizzell, who carried about five Crusaders with him over the try line, he had a few big runs. He couldn't get through. <clears throat> yeah, there was with six minutes left to go. The Chiefs were up thirty-one to seventeen. My wife told me to put money on the Highlanders, and I was shaking my head at her, saying she let me down. But she she said to me as well, they're still in this. She doesn't know that much about rugby, but boy, oh boy, was she correct. Uh, Narecki, as soon as he came on, he just hit the ball with pace. I don't even think, think the ball was meant for him. And he ran it in from his own half and just defeated the whole Chiefs line to score in the 75th minute. Yeah, he, um, he, he terrorised them, but you could also tell... He was hitting lines and he was looking for those really tired forwards. And boy, were they oh, tired. Yeah. The Chiefs had done a hell of a lot of defending. For sure. Um, but yeah, c- comeback of the year was completed. Uh, scoring in overtime, the Highlanders to, to de- defeat the Chiefs at the death with C.O. Tompkinson slotting through to, to score under the posts. Interestingly, Rugby Ecology, again, they had a stat here that the Highlanders had... of overlap. So throughout the whole match, almost a third of the time they had overlaps and they had options out wide. It just took later on in the match before they started to be able to utilize that because the Chiefs were tired from doing all their work in tight to stop the ball getting out wide. Uh, Other stats were the three pass sequence. We talked a little bit with the Tars. The, The Highlanders had 20 three pass sequences, whereas the Chiefs only had seven, electing to keep it in a little bit tighter. The Highlanders had 62% of possession, 65% of territory. The Chiefs, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. The Chiefs only ran 278 metres compared to 635 for the Highlanders. Highlanders had 27 to 17 tackle busts, 19 to four line breaks, 64 to 33 game line carries. 14 to 4 offloads, just dominating in most things. 
tackle percentage, they it was 82% for the Chiefs, 78% for the Highlanders, and there was parity at scrum and lineouts, 12 penalties each and a yellow card each. Man of the match, we touched on him, Lachlan Boshia, 73 points. He scored himself a try, three tackle busts, two line breaks, t 10, uh, no, sorry, 10 tackle busts. That can, that 10 tackles, that cannot be correct. And two turnovers. Aaron Smith also had 73 points with a try, a tackle bust, two line breaks, a try assist, and 91 passes. For the Chiefs, Anton Leonard Brown got 51 points, and Bradley Slater got 50 points. Highlanders, Shannon Frizzell got 70 points, while Marie, Marino Machielli Tu'u got 52 points. And just to pour some salt uh, on the wound for Nelson, if. Uh, it was the first time they took off uh, Michele Tu'u and uh, left Shannon Frizzell on. Now, I think I think you can't take Frizzell off. But to be fair, I wouldn't have taken Tu'u off either. Uh, find someone else to take him off, you know. But um, no, Frizzell's playing out of his Wasn't skin. Happy about this, that. Is, this is what we wanted to see from him. Early, like 45 minutes in too. Absolute stitch up. Good stuff. Very good. All right. Um, that That's our one trade done and deuced. So let's move on to the, uh, the main course. So in... Uh, draft Rugby Round 4. The buys this week will be to the Reds and the Highlanders. The Highlanders <laughs> will be uh, stoked to have gone as that with a win. And in the first fixture on Friday night, we have the Reds and the Waratahs. I'm oh, sorry, the Rebels and the Waratahs. Um, and I think they're playing... Uh, <clears throat> well, they're playing in Sydney, but is it in SCG? I forget where, actually where it is. You guys know? Uh, uh, I think it is. I think it yeah. is. Pretty sure it's in the SCG, um, but it was it was real weird. The last games of the SCG it was it was like w impossible to get a ticket. Like even the members you had to go into a ballot, and then half of them didn't get notified. I don't know. So chances are that we won't be going to this game. But um, looking forward to it nonetheless. So uh, Harry, do you want to take us through who's returning in this one? Yeah. So in this one, Mariki Corabetti. Obviously, the Rebels had a bye last week, so there's a few guys coming back from that break. Mariki Corabetti had his concussion. Uh, where he got his head taken off by none other than Hunter Paisami. The one and only. Uh, he should be back, we expect, if he hasn't been decapitated. Uh, Isi Nasarani as well was a uh, touch and go, I think, for a couple of weeks ago for his hamstring. So he should be completely sweet for this one. I think he had this one circled in the calendar to be the target game for him. Then on the Waratahs side of things, you had Jake Gordon <coughs> and Lalakai Paketi as well who are both targeting this <clears throat> both from hamstring injuries. I think they've still both got to go through fitness tests at the moment. Um, worth noting that there are squillion hamstring injuries out there at the moment as everyone's come back from this break and started running again. Um, so, I mean, that'll obviously have a few repercussions. I would expect Jake Gordon to go straight into the start if he is named. Mitch Short's been reasonable for the Waratahs, but I don't think he's anything, done anything to kind of demand that jersey. And Lalakai Paketi, I mean, he's kind of fallen out of favour, in and out of favour, had a few chances. But I'm not sure that Walton's quite done enough either. So I think he's deserving of a shot as well. Yeah, I think Jake Gordon will be really good. That'll be something the Waratahs was lacking. Just um, Mitch Short, to be fair, he's, he was better than Nick Phipps ever was because he just doesn't fuck up. Um, but and passes the ball to the man. And passes <laughs> the ball to the man. But um, look, he doesn't really create anything or threaten anyone around the rucks. He just kind of shovels it on. Whereas Jake Gordon is, uh, he really threatens and keeps the defenders honest. Um, and he's also, Jake Gordon's one of those guys that runs those fantastic halfback support lines. You know, that's why he, he's got so many tries. He just pops up in the right place at the right time. So um, he could be very valuable, valuable for them. For sure. Right, I'll, I'll keep going. The uh, <laughs> Rebels and the Waratahs. Someone said here they look like they're the two teams fighting it out for third, but I don't necessarily agree. I, I, I think everyone's expecting the force to come last. I think the Rebels have also <clears> been <throat> on the road the whole time. So depending on what happens down in Melbourne, obviously they've got some pretty strict COVID restrictions on on the moment. They've shuffled their diary around at the moment, the, the fixtures around to play their away games in the first half of the season. So yeah, they've had a draw against the Reds um, and they had a, a close loss against the Brumbies. I think they still have a really good opportunity to come home strong. They're they're a much better side than I think we give them credit for in the Australian Conference often. So yeah, they were. I think there's still a chance to come second. They they were quite up there. 
in the the first part of the season. A few things have been lacking for me. I, th I think with them, yes, they've been disrupted, but as have the force and the force have come out a firing. I know that neither of them really getting the result, um, but the force have been playing better than expected. Rebels have been playing, I, I think, a lot a lot worse than expected. Uh, you can't just all blame it on on. Uh, I, I think the the fact that they're not at home. I mean, they did, didn't they? Draw in Queensland, and didn't they almost beat the Brumbies in Canberra? Their their back line has been absolutely useless. Their forward pack has been quite impressive, but yeah. they've got a, a really really solid back line where you, there's a lot of big names in there. They just haven't been able to utilise their wingers. Cora Beatty, he he hasn't been utilised at all. Kellaway hasn't been utilised at all. Uh, they don't even know whether Hodge is going to be a starter or not. He hasn't really been able to find himself in that back line. Um, DSP has oh. been playing quite well. Um, but yeah, I, I really think their back line's been really lagging in this competition so far. Their forwards have stepped up a lot. People like Pranifal and Masili coming through and adding a lot of grunt for them. They have been missing Issy Nasarani, but I, I do think there's a lot of improvements they're going to need rather than just playing at home. I agree. I think you, you hit the nail on the head um, when you're saying that, look, they just haven't been able to get it out to their world-class backs. We haven't seen anything from Callaway or Korobiti. Um, I mean, DHP is trying to throw himself in there to get involved, but it, it, where, where is it breaking down then? Because um, I think Billy Meeks has actually been pretty good, but, um, but it, it seems to be breaking down in the centre. It's either the halves pairing or the centres where it's just not making it out. Um, like, where, what do we think the problem is there? I, I think it's their tactics. I think Bill Meeks has probably been stifled with the ball a little, a little bit more this, this shorter season than what he has in the past, to be honest. Mm. I think that, uh, that intercept try that he scored kind of papers over a few of the cracks for him. Yeah. Campbell Magna, I thought, was pretty solid. He ran a couple of good lines and kind of got to the outside and created some opportunities for his outside backs last week, a couple of weeks ago as well. So I, I don't think there's any one player. To me, I think it's more the fact that they've played a very big kicking game and they have relied heavily on their forwards in there in trying to truck it over the line. So I think mm. truly it's just tactical and trying to get the ball out a little bit more and give them the opportunity. Yeah, no fair. I think um, we said, I, I said maybe a week ago or two weeks ago that um, it was interesting is the first time the rebels, uh, it was the forwards were the ones not letting the team down, that the forwards were really bringing it, particularly at the set pace, you know, they were taking the Brumbies to school at the scrum. Um, and uh, I think, we expect that probably to continue. Love to see as much of the pony as possible, but um, I think Nazarani coming back will be a ma massive bre breath of fresh air. Um, just because you just, the work rate of the men. I mean, pony has been making some great game line carries, but Nazarani will make about 10 times the carries. Just no one can get through the amount of work that he does. And with that much game line ball, the backs have to be able to do something with that shortly. You know what I mean? I uh, also like I, I agree that I think tactics is probably a bit of bit of the issue. Week one against the Brumbies, they didn't really kick at all. In terms of their second match against the Reds, they just kicked consistently and kicked. I think it was two or three. It might have been being three times as much as they did in that first game against the Brumbies. So I, I don't know if it's as simple as they're kicking too much because the first game they didn't seem to kick that much. It just seems like there's not that direction and control when they're looking to use the backs, they have some of their forwards doing that grunt work, but there's just a link, there's something that's missing, but I, I do agree with Harry. I don't think it's a, a sole player. It, it's something a little bit deeper than that in the backs. All right, we'll talk in team sheets. I think um, for the Rebels, I don't expect much to change, poss except possibly Nazarani in and Hodge back in. Otherwise, I, I don't really think we'll see many changes for them. For the Tars, um, Depending on how Bell's injury uh, pans out, I think even if he's coming back, he'll probably be from the bench again. Well, they, um, they said that it's no guarantee in an article today. So, Okay, so Tommy Robertson back. I think Tom Horton has to get a start again after that performance. Yeah. Um, I think we talked about it last week, but I think Dempsey probably should start at eight again and will bring Will Harris in off the bench. Um, and so for me, it's just the question for me, which I think you guys will bat me down upon, but... Uh, uh, Newsom keeping uh, Nwingani Duase off the bench uh, on the oh, bench. Oh, mate, get his name right. Um, I, 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 I personally just don't... Winger, you don't need to tell us in the middle of his name. Yeah, it's true. I um, I don't think that Newsom... Like, I think Newsom is probably 13. I don't think he has the pace for a winger. Look, I mean, I shit on Newsom every week, but just uh, I think he's either going to play 13 mm. or be on the bench, basically, because yeah. the other wingers just bring so much more. 
I don't think he's a wing, especially with the, the competition he's got there. He, he does run some really solid lines. He's not bad in defence. I do think he's a 13. Walton probably had his best game to date at, at 13, but neither of them have really stamped their name on that jersey. And I think, look, the, the reason that uh, no one in Itawasi is not on the field at the moment or didn't get a run last week is because he's such a defensive liability. They haven't been getting him in the game enough, which is, <clears throat> I think, probably the rest of the back line's fault. He's not a winger at this stage that goes looking, so I don't think they should expect that from him. But he's definitely a liability in defence. And, and you know, I guess that's where Newsom is stronger. He's a good defender. Yep. Yeah, fair. Very good. All right, anything else from the Tars, really, that we're expecting for this weekend? I don't think any other personnel changes, really. We, we touched on Jake Gordon straight in there. Um, uh, but I think we're over time, so I'll, I'm just going to steal your line and say, can't wait to see Pony again. <laughs> that was my line, but yeah. <laughs> I, I think the one the one last thing to point out, that the line-outs uh, for the Waratahs has been dominant against the Brumbies and Force, like ridiculously dominant, while the Rebels lost faith in their, faith in their own line-out after 20 minutes against the Reds. So I'd be expecting the Tars, who have numerous kickers, to, to put that ball down into corners to try and use that 50-22 and back their own line-out, where I can't see the, the Rebels wanting to do the same. Rolling more Tom Horton try this weekend. <laughs> That's it. Were the, were yeah, the Rebels missing? Against, were the Rebels were the, the worst yeah. line-out mall defender as well. The worst. Yeah. Were the Rebels missing Stolberg last game? Or was he playing? Because he's he's an absolute weapon in the line out. No, he played. He did? Okay. Well, yeah. no excuses for them. All right. All right. Let's get on to the next game. Uh, the Crusaders and the Hurricanes. Now, I did now, now just remembering that um, I was going to make an analogy uh, about Harry versus Nelson at the start of this podcast where uh, the Hurricanes should enjoy their winning feeling for the week because um, they're not beating the Crusaders. It's not happening. You know what I mean? That's, that's just... Rule out any thoughts of that now. Are you, are you saying you're the Crusaders? Well, I was I was actually giving Harry credit as the Crusaders because he's won quite a few times oh. the last few years. But um, look, I'll be the Crusaders. the Crusaders. That's fine. That's fine. Um, but uh, anyway, we're getting into it. <laughs> Returning, Gareth Evans. Uh, personally, who cares? I think you guys think highly of Gareth Evans, but um, I don't. But uh, anyway, he, he, if he's back, if he's back, I think it'll be from the bench at this stage. Like, I don't think they'll yeah. throw him straight in the starting Great. team. But um, Princep's been good. He's uh, he's the only spot for another week. Yeah, I know. The problem with him is he just doesn't excite me. I uh, yes, he gets through all his tackles. He he hits a lot of rucks. He can steal the ball, but you got to excite me. Right? I want to see Princep excite you. Does they're Prince just miss, they're missing. You? They've got Artie, but they're missing that Victor Vito. You know what I mean? Just someone who's punching it up. Um, for mine, I think they need to get Isaiah Walker Leawary in there in the starting team. Yes, because he, he can carry. Sure, right. But um. Anyway, um, what do we think with the teams here? Uh, I guess, let's go through the Crusaders. So, I'm very biased, but um, can we just get Will Jordan on the bloody park, please? Um, he's still, I think, even after a bye and coming off the bench last week, got the most, might still have the most metres in <laughs> Super Rugby after all. Like, I don't know. Um, I, I stand by that uh, Razor Robinson just spins a wheel with all the backs' names on it each week, and that's wherever they land is where he picks them. So I, I reckon it's uh, just purely luck of the draw, Jack Good Hughes. <clears throat> for a week. He should just his wife pick right. or something. You know what I mean? Like, just it makes no difference anyway. Yeah, that would allow yeah. David Havili to play twelve, and you can get. One <coughs> that's uh, I, I reckon that's that's what you should put your hands on. Right. Are we now at the stage where we're saying that somehow Jack Good Hughes is the worst back? No, no, back? he's been great. Is no, that... no, he's been great. He turned it around. I said that one week and he was a phenomenal. So no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> no, very good. Also phenomenal. So that's not that good enough. That's true. Maybe right, Bridges um, let down. Looking at well, looking at positions then. So the backs backs, as Harry said, spin a whale, um, flip a coin, flip a few coins, who knows? Um, but with the back row, uh, we've certainly seen some interchanges there. But um, if they're both fit, uh, Billy Harmon or Tom Christie. I think Harry's written in here, Tom Christie, hands down. Um, yes. Yep, for sure. I agree. Yeah. Okay. No Just, doubt. No question, even, no question there. Question mark. No, no question mark. All right. Well, let's move straight on then. Um, and what about <laughs> six? I'm not sure where we're at with six. So obviously, Vetu Douglas, uh, where to? The Uber driver. Um, at right. number okay. But uh, six, who have we got? Cullen Grace, uh, Cullen Ethan Grace Blackadder. Is they both out? Um, Ethan Blackadder, I think they said that he had a knee injury and was consulting a surgeon. Might need a clean out which mm -hmm. to me means he's either got he said, a loose bit of something 
front uh, floating around. So if it's right. just a loose bit of bone, he could be back this week, but more likely it's a clean up of his meniscus or something, and it's going to be at least a few weeks out. So he's yeah, touching yeah. go, I reckon. You've got to lean towards Tom Sanders, or if they're, they're just wanting to spin that that wheel, that maybe they'll throw Sione Havili in as well for a bit of fun. True, I was, I I was going to say maybe put David Havili there. That way you don't have to leave him. <laughs> well, I was going to say if David Havili for some reason is not on the field, then Sione Havili is going to start because you've got to have Havili on the field. That's yeah, yeah, the that's true. basic premise. Um, all right, for this one, uh, I think one of the big points that we've talked about is. Um, Crusaders, how many tries they score score off their rolling mall, whether it's actually a, a rolling mall try or whether they just bring suck everyone in and then spread it wide. Um, I think the Hurricanes are going to have great difficulty defending that. Um, but, and you've made a great point here, one of you, uh, particularly when um, Asafra Amua in the second half uh, starts throwing the line out straight to the Crusaders as well. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, what? How do we see the Hurricanes dealing with that? We don't. <laughs> the Crusaders games are actually getting the, the easiest to talk about because we could just, you can't deal with them and move on. Well, I saw, a, I saw a stat that said out of all the games so far across both competitions, no game has been decided by 10 points or more, except the Crusaders games and three of those have been. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the writing's on the wall, really. Yeah. So you mean to make Super Rugby competitive, Get rid of the Crusaders. Yes. No, or, I, just don't, I still stand by New Zealand can't support more than one competitive team. <laughs> yeah. or, or let's just spread the Crusaders players amongst the four Australian franchises yes. and then we'll win consistently. No, only the ones that aren't capped by New Zealand. Yes. Okay. I'll uh, let's go on. Come on. Yeah. All right. Hurricanes. No, all right. Um, I think the thing, my point. what we all want to see this match for sure is Sever Race smashing La Mape. Just like, what happens when an immovable object hits an unstoppable horse? What happens? I don't know. I want to see it. Um, we'll find oh, out. I'm hopefully. on the edge of my seat to see that happen. Please, <laughs> please, please, please. I don't think La Marpe will be running down the wing this week. Put it that way. No. Nah. True. We, so we're relying on Sebu to go hunting for him, basically. Okay. Search and destroy. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, look, this one, I mean, what do we say? Crusaders, uh, they're obviously going to win. Um, they're just too composed, too good. Hurricanes, it's going to be all about attitude and it's going to be about... I mean, it's just it's too easy and too cliche to say, but it's going to be about a massive start and then staying through in it, stay in it for the last uh, for the whole eighty meters, the whole eighty minutes. You know? I really think scrum is going to be really telling. So, so the Hurricanes. There was a stat during the game last week saying the Hurricanes score half their tries through their scrum, and right. I, I stand by that. I think their their forward pack has been really good at the scrum in this in Aotearoa. I mm. think it's been better than I've seen in a long time. I'm actually starting to think Lomax isn't the worst prop in New Zealand, <laughs> believe it or not. And uh, and I think if they can get some parity there against what is what has been the benchmark scrum in New Zealand for a number of years, then I think that will go a long way to giving them some opportunities. But my, my gut feel is that uh, Crusaders are the benchmark there for a reason. And every time a team needs to scrum well against them, they they make a, a, an absolute mark of it to demolish the opposition. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a bit worried for the Hurricanes because of that. Yeah. No, that's fair. All right. Any last points for this one? I guess, um, should, should TJ just start at 10? Uh, should he not play 10? Should Geordie start at 10? I mean, we said every week we want Geordie at 10 and chase tear tear out back. Look, Geordie, I don't see it happening. Geordie, I, I thought was awesome this week. And between the Barretts, he was the one who showed that he was willing to, have a crack at things like ball in the air, things like that. He really wanted to get involved. Get this guy amongst it in, in tight. Do not put TJ at 10. It sounds like all Barrett's need to be 10, basically. TJ goes to 10. I guarantee the Crusaders find a way to score against him being out of position within the first 30 seconds. I agree. <laughs> Very good. All right. So Crusaders by how many? And let's move on. I'm going to say Crusaders by 18. 12. Eight. All right. Good. What do you got, Harry? 15. 15. All right. Even it out. Very good. All right. Um, Next game. This next one, uh, Force v. the Brumbies in terms of returning. Maybe we see Ryan Lonergan from his ankle. Who cares? Not with Uh, Isaac Fiennes' form, mate. He just won the game for him. I was going to say, not likely, mate. Isaac Fiennes is right there. 
Harry, I, I talked about Isaac Fines the last two years. You've never rated him. We haven't thought anything about him, mate. Less than Paul's player, mate. Who talks about those guys? That's very mate, good. He is I, good. I have to back Harry here. I'm sorry. Uh, let the guy start. And hopefully we see the return of Solomon Ikata. That guy is exciting. The team. Uh, I would say the Aussie Lamarpe, but he's not Aussie. So, uh. All Lamarpe. <laughs> he has previously played for the New Zealand Warriors uh, in rugby league, I think you might. Yeah. So, look, the Force have shown that they can be competitive in this competition. The Brummies have shown they're not as far ahead of the pack as we first thought that they would be. Um, there's a few issues there with some of the breakdowns, but there is also for the Force with their lineouts. So hopefully it's not a game where we just see some terrible lineouts and we actually see some competitive scrums between these two teams. Um, the thing that I think is most exciting here is I don't think we will see it, but Richard Kahui has been announced in the force. Um, I don't care how old that bloke is. And I mean, originally he stated himself, he was never quick enough to be a winger. So if we see him come on, you're going to see him at centre. And I just want to see him come out of the line and munch some of these Brumbies players because how exciting will that be to see? Nick Frisby as well. We might be able to see him. Godwin, I think he was a little bit better um, on his his time this week. So hopefully we get to see him come into the starting side. Interestingly, this is an, a home game for the Force, but it's being played at Leichhardt Oval in New South Wales in Sydney. Um, so technically, I mean, the Brumbies are already up in Sydney having to, to stay, whereas the Force, I think, were they were they in Queensland last week? No, no, I think they played in... Yes, they were in Queensland. I'm sorry, I take that back. That's not cool. So they're the only one travelling out of the two. Ian Pryor said on Twitter... I was going to say, um, they're probably on Twiggy's private jet, you know what I mean? They can go anywhere. It's no, it's no dramas for them. Yeah, true. Um, I, I hit Ian Pryor up myself after his injury on the weekend on Twitter and he said he came off and stayed off as a precaution and he thinks he'll be sweet for this week. Um, but yeah, uh, it, this is going to be an interesting game. If, if you said this at the start of the season, we would have thought the Brumbies were going to run away by 50. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if the Brumbies don't have Lalesio, which you'd put your money on at the moment, um, Bailey Kunzel looked not bad. Um, mm. He'll get his he first. Uh, yeah, I was going to say I thought he was fantastic. No, he's he's good. I think he, I think he's good. Um, mm. Look, Lalesio is big boots to fill in terms of what he's done in a small amount of time. So that's what I mean by not bad. I think Bailey Kunzel is a Newington boy, a Burrineer boy, Southern Districts boy. All the clubs I, I've played at. So I'm excited to see this guy having. So that's where he went wrong, and that's why he's not starting for a franchise. He, he, he probably will be starting. Especially was how strong his running game was, whereas Lalesio has been lauded for how well he's controlled a game and kicked. So, mm. you know, on top of his running game as well. So, I guess that's the main difference that we're seeing between the two at the moment. Kunzel's yeah. a big unit. I think when I picked up Mac, Mac Hansen in our original draft, I thought I was picking up Kunzel because he's, 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 what, 100, almost 100 kicks, big guy. Yeah, yeah he, he's. I think he'd be high nineties. He's he'd be six foot one or so. He's not a not a massive height, but he's a he's a strong fella. Mm. Um, yeah, but look, I think for for the force, they're going to be heavily reliant on this back row that is just getting through some work week in week out at the moment. They they're all putting their hands up to to make bulk tackles, to make bulk runs, which is actually working really well for their game plan. To, to have John O'Lance hitting that line flat with runners around him because it sucks in the defenders and it creates that space, creates those gaps for these these attacking wingers um, like Ralston to, to hit at pace. So for them, it's, it's going to be important that they can do that work in tight to try and create some of these gaps. Um, the battle of the outside backs is going to be an inter interesting one for the Brumbies. If Cutter is back, they've got Mirrorhead, who's been really, really good other than his card. They've got Wright, who's been fantastic, um, but they're both more in that similar mold, while Cutter is, is more of an aggressive barnstorming runner. Um, but So I can't see Mirrorhead and Wright starting. I agree with whoever wrote that point down. Um, but Mirrorhead, look, he has been awesome. Um, I think this must be Harry writing. He is the Aussie Sean Wyanui. Oh, get off it, mate. 
Yeah, I yeah, won't even give like, up that. No, no, dead set. We ragged on Muirhead. I still this rag on him. I get after week. He still not had a bad game. Harry, he I just performs week in, week yeah. out, and I don't know how. Sean You've Murray said that just because he's got the cornrows that Wayne Dewey has been rocking previously. <laughs> it's, it's, it has nothing to do with how he plays, and it's purely that we never expect anything from him, and he just keeps playing well. Well, I just want to point out, Harry, you recently said that Wayne Dewey is the – Kiwi Rob Horn, and if then uh, Muirhead is the Aussie wine Nui that makes Muirhead the Aussie Rob Horn, is that right? Yes, I'm confused. He's the second coming. <laughs> okay, well, it's all good because hopefully he's not playing this week and we get Carter back in there to actually play some rugby. Prags, your boy, Tutu, is he past it finally? I don't think he's past it, but we just haven't seen a lot of him. I, I'll tell you the problem. The problem is, and I called it his at the age. start of Super Rugby this year, it's that um, Simone is just has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I like really liked Simone when he was playing NRC and then for the Tars. I just think he didn't get enough of an opportunity at the Tars. I think it was a massive loss to lose him. But um, he because not only is he a ball player and can kick, he's taking a lot of those choo-choo hit-ups, um, which for me as a dedicated choo-choo uh, fantasy owner. He's becoming very frustrating. But, um, I mean, TK, one of the things that always gets underrated is his defensive uh, decision-making. He's a fantastic yeah. defensive 13, which is why he always finds himself in the Wallabies. But, um, yeah, he just hasn't been making those, um, those hit-ups. And it's been a while since I've seen the old choo-choo try celebration. So, um, so you're not on board with uh, shifting Solomon Akata to the centres with R.A. Simone for a game just for a bit of fun against the Force? Well, no, because he's in my fantasy team. But no, I mean, and that's another thing. And obviously, when they had Simone and Carter, both of them were doing hit-up uh, crash balls in the centre of the field. It was leaving no space for TK. TK took six hit-ups on the weekend, and uh, he was getting over the ad line, but he wasn't making breaks. Mm. He was getting involved. line out a couple of times as well. You know, like, they are trying to use him, but he's just not breaking away like he used to. Six hit-ups. That's not trying to use the Blake. Oh, that's still that's a fair amount of opportunities for a, for an outside back, but um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, look, I'm biased. I just want to see more of the choo choo, but I, I can't see them dropping him. To be honest, he's he's kind of like the glue there, um, just because he's been there forever and he's the defensive structure. But, yeah. I, I wouldn't be dropping. It. If there's a game you do it, it is against the force, but there's just no way you're going to do it. Tom Wright, uh, and, yeah. and, and, and also, I mean, they're, they're all. They're all pushing for Wallaby selection still. You know what I mean? New coach. It doesn't matter that TK has been the incumbent for, or, or been there or thereabouts for years. Um, they're all keen to game time. You know what I mean? No one's going to be sitting anyway, here. Anyway, boys, I, I agree with that. But let's wrap this up. Mm. Uh, Brum- try, Tom Wright on your head. <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah, yeah, tune in for Nelson and Harry's podcast tomorrow night on Andy Muirhead. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Moving on, um, what, do we, what do we see the result in this? Uh, Brumbies by what? 12. 15. 18, I'll just round it out. We'll keep the, <laughs> just keep those same numbers clogging over. All right, now to uh, some, I was going to say more exciting rugby, but uh, no, probably more exciting rugby. I'm still Kiwi bias. Um, the Blues and the Chefs, the Chiefs, uh, and this is in Auckland, returning Hoskins Satutu, fairly handy player, if you've heard of him. Also, Caleb Clark. Fairly handy player, if you've heard of him. Oh, also, both in Nelson's right fantasy teams. Knowing what Nelson does to fantasy players, they might never start again. Actually, that's a very good point. That's true. I did ruin uh, Nuna Scudder's career. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Um, Chiba, James Parsons to come back from concussion. And Natoya Akoi, can also coming back from concussion, uh, the Chiefs' young lock. Um the Chiefs, how do they bounce back from last week? I mean, I think whilst it would be extremely disappointing to take the loss, and I just enjoy watching Warren Gatlin's face um, towards the end of these games more and more each week. Um, I don't know why. I can't get behind. I'm finding it hard to get behind the Chiefs with Warren Gatlin as the coach. I don't know what it is. I, he I'm hasn't. Sure. He hasn't done anything. But it's just. It's. I just don't feel the same way about them. But. Um, but no. How do, how do they bounce back? I, I think last week, early on, they were back to their best and, and what we want to see of them, willing to throw that ball around with, with some really uh, dynamic play. But, uh, I mean, they, they're going to learn from that one that the game's never done and you can't shut up shop. No, I don't think that they necessarily did, but they relied too heavily on, on people like um, uh, Boshia to, to steal them that ball numerous times at the back end of that game rather than really being able to finish it themselves as a team. 
Um, so I think if they won that one, it would have been purely on his shoulders in the last 10 minutes. He only so, had a couple of turnovers for the game, right? Sorry? He only had a couple of turnovers for the game, though. Yeah, they're all, no, but also penalty, forced penalties. Right. And numerous forced penalties in the back end of that game as well. So uh, yeah. I think they, if they can start like that, like they did last week, it's going to be really important for them. I don't think they can have a slow start against the Blues, um, but they're just going to have to find a way to, to stay in this game for 80 minutes. I agree. No, I reckon this game's all on the Blues. I reckon... The Chiefs are snatching, finding ways to snatch a, a, a defeat from the jaws of victory week mm. in, week out. And I think Gatlin has not got them in a confident headspace. I think their their confidence must be completely shot, to be honest, by this stage. Um, I, I think the, the Blues' defence was very weak in the first 60 last week and it took them until the last 20 minutes to start to actually make their tackles. But even then, then they weren't pushing off the line. So... I think the only way that would happen this week is if they were very tired. And I don't believe that will happen when they're, with them rotating some of their big players, like, as you mentioned earlier. And on top of that, I think they've got a home game. So they're going to have another packed house to try, try and cheer them on. And I think those couple of things, the rotation of their key players and having the crowd behind them, the massive sold-out crowd behind them, and as it has been for their other home games, I think that will mean that their attitude is good enough that I just don't see how the Chiefs can actually get through them. Yeah, I think that'll play a massive part. I think um, this is this is the pivotal point of the Blues season. Like this will be the defining point, basically. I mean, it's about halfway through, but um, if they if they lose this, I reckon it'll be significant impact on how they travel for the rest of the season. Whereas mm -hmm. if they win this, it's kind of like, all right, we're back on track. Let's do it. It's Crusaders, us, daylight, the next teams. Uh, or yeah. Right. But the Blues, after to, after their recent loss, it, it's going to make it a very tough trot for them to actually take this with no finals. Crusaders are going to have to lose to them and someone else. It's all over. Yeah, it's all it's all over. But I, I think the Blues have a lot to fight for. The Chiefs haven't won a single game yet. So, I mean, if the Chiefs lose this one, maybe Australia should say, hey, Kiwis, maybe you guys can only have four Super Rugby sides. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, I forgot. It's um, there's no finals in the Super Rugby Arthur. So um, no, it is in fact uh, done and deuced. Um, but uh, yeah, all right. Player selections in this one. Um, do we see anything really new? Do we see Bowden play another thirty at, at uh, fly half or more than that? I don't know. I, I think the writing's on the wall. You know, we said a couple of weeks ago when the Blues were winning that we thought that that was papering over the performance of the team with a Terra Black at 10 and Bowden Barrett at 15. I think we've all seen that Bowden isn't able to have an effect on a game that he should at 15. Mm. So, and, and I mean, there was a, some player boating going around uh, over, over the last couple of weeks in New Zealand. And they said that they thought Bowden was the best fly half in the country. And he didn't rate in the top few. A couple of the ex Kiwi players were saying even he was the fifth choice fullback. So, I mean, it's a no-brainer. You need to put him at 10. And we've seen what he does when he's a threat with the ball in hand. I, I think this is the time the Blues have lost a couple of games. It's time to throw him in and give him the opportunity at fly half. Yeah, I agree. And I think we've said... I'll just jump in. I'll say, I think we've said every week, who do you play at 15 then? I think they, they only really have Matt Duffy. So I think that's their 15. Um, and that's not the worst. I think the amount that you gain from Bowden at 10, um, Matt Duffy's more than good enough at 15. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I don't think Duffy's a bad player. He's not going to be making big mistakes. Uh, I think he he does have a decent quality to him in, in attack as well. But I think another thing that I'd like to see is sorry, Harry Plummer, but TJ Fayani, he's got to be coming into that twelve jersey, and I think he he would actually pair quite well with Bodie Barrett. Bodie Barrett does not need Harry Plummer outside him. So get get the likes of TJ Fayani who who can offer a different style of play. He can run the ball. He can he can still do kicks. He can still set up, but he can also straighten that that line a little bit better. And I think that will be a good way to, to fill a couple of their defensive holes as well. I think watching those last two games back by the Blues, they have some real issues with their midfield defence. They seem to give a lot of holes with people running tight under lines or the little offload inside or... You know, they, they just get disconnected. And, you know, there was a couple of tries to Coles and Lamarpe. There was another one of Will Jordan to kind of seal the game for the Crusaders as well. 
that it seems to be an ongoing problem for them. And I think putting the world's best fly half at 10 and the experienced TJ Fayane, who is what he's the captain of the Auckland side as well. Mm. I think that's a much more solid pairing for them there. Yep. Yeah, I agree. All right. Um, do we any personnel changes for the Chiefs? Perhaps uh, our Koi to slot straight back in to the starting side, but otherwise, I don't really think we'll see many changes. Uh, Solomon Alamolo was unfortunately really quiet on the weekend. He just couldn't get his hands on the ball, but um, I think we'll see him start again. I, I'm not sure we'll see Nankerville start there again. I, I do like him, but they, they have been favouring Quinn Tapea. Um, I suppose we did see Anton Leonard Brown backfiring, playing at 13, which maybe gives them a, another another thought about keeping him there. But I think chances are we, we see Quinn Tapea back. Well, I, I haven't been uh, keeping up with the casualty ward as much as I should have, but the commentators on the weekend made it suggested, like they made it seem like Nankervell was returning from and not being 100%, and that could be why Quinta Pyre had been getting picked ahead of him the first mm. few weeks. Uh, look, if you look early, that's for sure. Yeah, if you looked early on at the start of the year when they were both available, Quinta Pyre definitely seemed to be the favourite of the two. Yeah. For sure, no. I just I was, I was I just remember making a note that they seem to suggest that Nankervell's the preferred option. I was very surprised by it, so... Um, I guess we'll have to uh, watch this space. But, um, yeah, certainly Nelson with Nankerville and his team is not feeling confident that he'll be there for him this weekend. I had a, uh, a little fantasy footy nugget as well for, uh, for the managers out there. I'm a Josh Goodhue owner. I really like his work rate, which is non-existent at the moment. <laughs> um, basically, I've decided he's good if Gerard Kelly Tuioti is, on, is not on the bench and he's not good when he is on the bench. So... <laughs> Cali Tuioti is coming on in the 40th or 41st minute for, for Good Hugh when he's on the bench, which means he's just not racking up the minutes to get his runs and tackle counter. Whereas the week before that, where they were using, is it Connor that started at six? Aaron week? Carroll? I think Carroll. so. Carroll. Carroll. Carroll that started at six week, this week and was on the bench instead the week before. They're using him as the, a loose forward replacement. And then just because he can cover lock as well, Goodhue was playing 80 minutes or, he, you know, he played 86 minutes or whatever it was when they played <clears> him <throat> overtime as well. So, to me, I'm going to sack him. Heads up to both of you guys and the rest of our league if uh, if Kelly Tuoti is on the bench and, and not otherwise. Not interested. Very good. I mean, he's got the name, but that's about it. Um, all right. Uh, in, in terms of... Uh, well, let's just jump to where do we... What are we calling this game at? Um, I mean, I, I could be skipping ahead here, but I think... Uh, I think the Chiefs, yeah, the, the the Blues forward pack will be a lot more on the ball in defending the Chiefs rolling malls. Um, mm. So I think there'll be a crackdown a lot on that. How's the Blues line out as well? Um, I think it's been pretty good. The Blues line out is very good mm. with Patrick Tupelotu steering them around. Mm. And then I think their scrum is better with Parsons than it is with Eklund, although Eklund's great around the park as well. So... Assuming they're back, their set piece should be solid and their, their rolling ball D is pretty solid as well. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, the Chiefs, off to their slow start in the last few weeks, but, you know, one of the things that gave them a fair bit of momentum this week was that rolling ball. And I think you take that away from them and, and again, I, I, you might find that it's a team struggling to find some go forward and some try scoring opportunities. All right, let's call it. Um, I'm going to say the Blues will win this um, and I'm going to say by 10 points. <sighs> Only the Crusaders win by that many. Yeah. Nine. Nine. Oh, okay, yeah. One point less. All right, mate. Yeah. I'm going to say eight. eight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're the losers, the bungee. Um, I was going to say 10 first of all. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, that's uh, the main course, round four of draft rugby, fantasy rugby. And that takes us to some yummy, yummy dessert. Um, or Deserto. Uh, we've been missing out. Has our dessert song been getting in there? I haven't listened back to the pod. Uh, it does, mate. Yes, I still produce the podcast. Okay, excellent. That's good. <laughs> uh, good to know. Um, we still do our work, Craig. Yeah, good. Excellent. I've been cutting you out as much as possible for the record, though. Oh, fantastic. I've, no, that's I've good. I realise you start every segment with, um... <laughs> So I just it's, that out. It's, a, it's a trademark of the professional podcaster to start with a long arm. That's just how you get it done. So, yes. Uh, all right. For dessert, fantasy front runners by position. So, we're just going to 
go through all the positions and who's been killing it. So as always, I'll, ta- I'll start with the props, the most important position and one close to my heart. Uh, HJH, Harry Johnson Holmes, three from three games. Uh, I don't actually have his average here, so I could, I'll have to get that up. But um, he Is has... Um, average from three games. Say again? It says it right there, 37 average from three games, chump. Oh, okay. Well, I can't see it, but... And how, how wrong did he prove us? We all said he was going to suck swapping sides of the scrum. Yeah, well, he no, did at the start of the year. We, we paid him out for being a bit too chubby. I mean, I remember seeing in the first preseason game, I was like, uh oh. He looks just, a bit uh, longer. He's been That's fantastic. Yeah, he did. He's, he's definitely, he's like, right, maybe I don't need to carry all this weight to the scrum. But no, he's been fantastic. And, and he's, a, he's a lock on that number three jersey. He's got no competition. So he definitely made the right choice in uh, changing sides. For sure. Um, it'd be tough for him otherwise. That's it. But uh, otherwise, the other prop who I um, name dropped earlier in the pod was Angus Wagner. So uh, former Queensland boy for the force. Um, he's been absolutely crushing it um, as well. So been really holding his own in the scrum. Uh, obviously, they've only played two games so far. But um, what's his average? I realise my uh, my sheet hasn't been updating. I think... 37 least. also, mate. Also 37, okay. So they're tied on 37 then, um, but you'll find Harry Johnson Holmes has played three weeks and Angus Wagner's only played two. So that's some great insight right. there. Mm. Yeah, Angus Wagner is quite a good young um, prop. He, he played a bit of time with the Vikings as well. I think, I think he's a good prop to keep an eye on for Australia in the future. Yes, very good. All right, well... Uh, May, who's got a 34 average from his couple of games as well as the reserve. Fantastic. Who wants to take us into the hookers? Yeah. Nelson, they're your field of you expertise. Well, why, why, no, why not, mate? Uh, I've been told that I, I need to move to hookers from the back row, so I'll, I'll take this one. Asafa Amua, he has an average of 48 from his three matches. Most importantly, two of those match, matches have been from the bench. He's had one start from three, and he has a 48-point average. That is scary. Cody Taylor, he's got 47-point average from two games. Kurt Eklund, one star, one bench, 41-point average. For me, I think a notable mention was Tom Horton this week getting his first start with 66 points. He's had two games off the bench, one with 30-odd minutes, one with 20-odd minutes, and he's got a 37-point average. But expect to see him getting some more game time. Now, I, I didn't think I'd ever say this, but um, we all do love Dane Coles. But um, can he hurry up and retire, please? I just want to see Asafa Mua week in, week out. Uh, he'll be up there in my fantasy draft. I think I said that two weeks ago. Less than four, Yeah, for the next 10 years. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I said, actually, I don't care if he doesn't play hooker. Just start him in the, at six jersey then, whatever. Just get him on the field, you know. At lock, Lukan Salakaya Lotto has a 45 average from his three games. And that's been on the back of uh, a big work rate and some massive defense as well. So he's been playing out of his skin since he shift back to lock. And funnily enough, since he's done that, he actually looks more... Yeah, the tall building. <laughs> um, Fergus Lee Warner... The tall building, mate. He's, uh, he's, he's decided... I was going to say he's decided he's had to step up and play uh, for all three of the locks that have uh, left the Reds. He's, he's yep. got to fill the boots of uh, everyone. Well, he's still not jumping because they don't have a line out. Yeah. Uh, also, Fergus Lee Warner has the 32 average from his couple of games. So the Western Force man, uh, former uh, Western Sydney Rams player. So shout out to the greatest club in the world that doesn't exist anymore. Do you guys know any, any anyone that sells beanies for the... The Western Sydney Rams. Yeah, if anyone wants hundred, we've got you covered. Yeah, if anyone wants a couple hundred beanies, let us know. Great investments. <laughs> and uh, Sam Whitelock, twenty nine average from a couple of games as well. So workman like from him, he was good before the break uh, and better than normal, to be honest, as well for his standards. So he's consi- he's consistently scoring well as well. Very good. I'll take the back row because Craig doesn't want to. Uh, Lachlan Boshia, he has dinner for two, 69-point average of his two games because he has an amazing work rate and he is an absolute freak. He had that man in some All Blacks jerseys. He's only two games. Yep. Oh, wow. Okay. I thought he played more. From from since our fantasy footy combat started for three weeks. Ah. Yeah. Uh, Yes that, yes, that does check out. I'm with us. Cool. Let's do it. I know we've been mainly saying Aussies, but just keep up. 
Um, also, Shannon Frizzell, he is back to his form. He's got 57-point average of his three games. Idi Sevilla had a massive one on the weekend and is starting to get back into form. He has now got 49 points a game from his three games. And Liam Wright, the first Aussie in the back row. Mind you, there's been quite a few decent Aussies, but he's the first one to slot them with a 48-point average of his three games. Fantastic, yeah, and that, that was actually my entire back row until uh, this this week. Traded out Liam Wright for a uh, yellow card from Sam Kane, so that was not a good decision. Are you on the toilet, Craig? Because I could have sworn that was a flush. No, it's actually my computer just taking off. Um, you know, the UFO, we're departing. Uh, it's time to go to bed uh, and just leave the country, leave the planet, really. But um, no, all right, scrum halves, Craig. Scrum halves, yeah. Let's let's keep it going. Um, Tate McDermott. Um, I think everyone. Saw that coming. Um, him and Aaron Smith together, average of 56 points. So Aaron Smith, I think, has really excelled the last two weeks. With uh, Last week, he bagged himself two tries this week, a pretty long-distance try. So some massive performances from him. But um, Tate McDermott, obviously, definitely the form uh, halfback. Uh, we'd say the form fantasy halfback for sure. Possibly the former halfback of um, of all the rugby being played at the moment as well. Uh, the last couple of weeks, Aaron Smith has been ridiculous. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, also, we have a special mention with TJ Perinara, very far behind, um, fifty-two point average. No, I'm just joking. Um, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, you can't really talk about halfbacks without talking about these three blokes. So um, yeah, that's huge. Those huge yeah, averages from, from halfbacks. Fly halves. Now, this one is tight, real tight. <laughs> you got Richie Moonga at, on 66 points as an average. So, I think the second best in the comp at the moment across all positions. Then, just behind him, Will Harrison from the Waratahs in second on 36 points on an average. This is easily, easily the biggest fantasy pick in the entire comp right now is Richie Mo. Has to be. Yeah, when when you talk about value of of the pick in comparison to his position, for sure. Mm. And if you wonder why Kagi lost last week, it's because he had Richie Mo sitting on the bench on bye. That's true. My first uh, draft pick, and I was I can't believe you got the words value based drafting haven't come out of both of your mouths. Uh, you basically live and breathe by the value based drafting. But um, we we alluded to it, mate. Works fifty percent of the time, Kagi. Works fifty percent of the time. <laughs> Very good. All right. Um, centres. Uh, well, I'll jump into the centres. Um, Nani Laumape, 54-point average. Um, man's been crushing it. Say no more. Uh, and Anton Lita brown Look, it's only been one game, so it's a kind of a bit of a cheat code here, but 51 points this week. Um, we're just going to assume that he's going to keep that up, 50 points every week. Is that the, that the ploy? Yep. 100%. <laughs> Very good. Those, and those then, two are always the top two centres. That's true. Actually, I think the ALB was top last year in over the whole Super Rugby 2019 season. Um, so that was pretty huge. Uh, and Jack Goodhue, 38 for the Crusaders. So somehow we possibly are talking about him being the worst uh, back in the Crusaders, but yet he's still on a 40-point average and, and probably very likely to start every week. So, hmm. All right, who wants to take us through the outside backs? Uh, I'll, I'll go because Nelson seems to be frozen in space at the moment with his eyes closed. I was going to say, that's the most silent I've ever heard of it. And it's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I'm a huge fan. Um, so, your boy, Will Jordan on top. We've lost him. 58 points for Will Jordan from one start and one bench. Does, so one does this mean that Nels doesn't get this pod cap? I feel like we can both agree mm-hmm. on that right now. <laughs> Didn't complete. Uh, Lester Finger and Nuku. Uh, from his one game and also Brian Ralston, Byron Ralston, sorry, from his two games on a 50 point average. So, yeah, even the reserve Crusaders backs to the best in the game. <laughs> and uh, Filippo Dalgunu, 48 points from his three matches as well. And he's been exceptional. So, I think he's been fire. Yeah, been better than I expected, to be honest, as well. Yep. Fantastic. Well, if you don't have some of these players in your fantasy team, I can tell you, you're doing it wrong. So, these are the players who you should have drafted early enough. I think if we go through and compare these players, you'd probably find that Harry and I would have more than Nelson. And that's just generally how, um, how it works in fantasy. We pick the good players. Nelson tries to, uh, I don't know what he does, to be honest. But um, it's excellent. I, I, I mean, 
I don't normally enjoy shitting on Nelson when he's not here. It's more fun when he is here. But um, no, look, he's, he, he seems to be connecting back. So we might just, he's back just to round out the pod. Nelson, are you, are you with us? Uh, I am, mate. I, d- I didn't want to leave you guys to talk junk. Excellent. We were just talking you up to the high heavens and how, how you're such a quality fantasy player um, and just quality bloke all around. So thank you for rejoining us. Um, and also, you now will get your complete pod cap because you have uh, been here too. <laughs> yeah. But, so. yeah. No, wait, anyway, look, if there's no other, no other business, boys, I think that's going to do us for another episode of the Drive Rugby podcast. Um, and we will catch you again in the next one. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Sounds good, boys. Stay slutty. Peace.